This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show 821. When I day one when I joined Grant's team, he used to underwrite a deal. I used to tell him two minutes. It's actually like 43 seconds. But I'm like, man, if I could underwrite a deal like Grant, then my whole life would change. What I do is I just take the number of units times the rents in place, not like what the broker's telling me, in place rents. And then I just use the occupancy of like 94 or 95%, depending on the marketplace. And then I just use rough numbers like, okay, my expenses typically in between 40 and 45%. And so I just, okay, this is what my NOI is going to be based on. Here's the income minus the expenses. Here's my NOI. And so I can solve for like on these bigger deals, they all trade at a cap rate. And so I literally can underwrite a multifamily deal, 300 units within two minutes. What's up, everyone? This is David Green, your host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, the biggest, the best, and the baddest real estate podcast in the world. Every week, we are bringing you stories, how to's, and answers that you need to make smart real estate decisions now in this current and ever-changing market. I'm joined today by my co-host, Roberto Abasolo, who does a great job today, by the way, Rob. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. This was a fun one. You know, you and I walked out of this with brand new shiny nicknames. You are the skyscraper of real estate, and I am the fire hydrant of real estate. And so, you know, I think people are really going to have to stick around to the very end to find out how how we got these self dubbed nicknames? That is a great point. Make sure you you check those out. This will be something funny. And when you see Rob in person, you're going to want to call him the Fire <laughs> Hydrant. <laughs> Today's guest is Ryan Seco, an airline pilot turned real estate investor who started buying some single family properties, turned that into multifamily. Now runs a fund and is crushing it. And he gives some great advice for how to do everything I just said, as well as. The right way to approach somebody to get into the right situation. I thought this was fantastic. Rob, what did you think about that? It was really good. It was it was really good because it he put himself out there in a way that showed value to someone else and solved the problem for them. And I think this is probably I mean, there are so many lessons to take away from today's podcast, but the way that he approached it and his willingness to just get in the mud, get a little dirty, figure things out and and really jump in the ring really set him apart. To really have one of the most amazing career transformations I think I've ever heard of on this podcast. So I'm excited for people to hear his career unfold as we get into it for the next hour. Yes, sir. This is a great episode. You're going to listen all the way through and take some notes. Before we bring in Ryan, today's quick tip is simple. Show up with solutions and not just problems. Any human being can show up and say, hey, boss, there's a problem over here. That doesn't help. It's better to come and say, hey, here's a problem and here's what I've already done to try to fix it. What do you think and what could I do better? Be the person bringing the solutions in your world, not the problems. And by the way, and I have have another quick tip. Number two, quick tip, light. All right. If you ever get intimidated by RE terms, RE means real estate, by the way, real estate terms, you don't know NOI, cap rate. LOI, go to biggerpockets.com slash glossary. If you've ever heard us toss around abbreviations or things that really, you know, like terms, a lot of the times that can be found on the glossary and it could explain it for you. We do our best to always stop and rewind and explain anything that might might be a little too uh, you know, might be a little bit too too much of an acronym. You know, it gets a little we get a little carried away with the like eight letter acronyms every so often. So yeah, go to biggerpockets.com slash glossary if you want to brush up. Yeah, I'm excited when he talks about the GQLMIP. Um, I think that's one of one of the most standard real estate principles out there. So let's bring in Ryan. Ryan Seiko, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Podcast. A little background for our listeners. Ryan's been investing for about 15 years. He started in single family and small multifamily early on in the state of Arizona. Has $3 million invested, making 10 to 12 a month, fully passive now, and we will find out why that is later. Ryan has a love of flying and leveraged that passion into a new career. The biggest hurdle he overcame was the do-it-yourself mindset, and we are excited to hear all about this. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Dave and Rob. Always great to be here. Thank you for that. Sounds like a lot of your foundation is built on being a pilot, which is important because I've learned the older I get how much the foundation of myself is built on looking at the world through the prism of a basketball player. It was like my first passion I ever had. So when I form a business, I build a team, I take an approach, I always see it analogous to playing basketball. I'm guessing that you're probably going to have something similar to being a pilot. Is that the case? Yeah, for sure. And, and and look, I I actually didn't even know I was going to be a pilot when I was growing up. My uncle, it was something that he always wanted to do. Uh, I was 17 years old. He was a builder. I wanted to buy my first uh, uh, house. And he looked at me, he says, son, you don't have any money. And so we were flying one day and he's like, 
I looked at him and I'm like, I could actually get paid to fly airplanes. And when he said yes, I was hooked. And so it was actually kind of a roundabout way for me getting back into real estate. But 1000%, I mean, aviation and flying, uh, like basketball, there's just a lot of discipline. Uh, there's a lot of training. There's a lot of checklist. And so that's helped me tremendously uh, transfer the skill set that I've learned in my 20s into um, you know buying real estate and, and managing real estate. So 100%. Oh, yeah. I imagine that's very much like your pre-flight checklist, buying properties and knowing what needs to be done when they're bought. You have to have great vision, know and trust your instruments, rely on the information that other people gave you and trust that you're getting good info. People are your priority. You value safety of others. You trust your team to get you on and off the ground and support you on this journey. In your opinion, what makes a great pilot? Um, so I think I think what makes a, a really good pilot is somebody who uh, has the ability to learn, but also stay uh, curious. Uh, you know, I heard when, when I was, when I was getting into becoming a pilot, you know, there's two different types of pilot. There's, there's, there's bold pilots and there's old pilots, but there's no such thing as a bold old pilot. And so these are the different sayings that we have in the aviation business, because, you know, we could all be bold. Uh, but at a certain point in time, you have to, you have to rely on, okay, what is the safe approach, you know, for the flight? And I really think that, you know, it's a constant training event. As a as a pilot, it's it's over and over and over. And so, what makes a tremendous pilot is somebody who flies a lot. Same in the real estate game. Who who who's the most proficient in real estate is somebody who's doing deal over deal over a deal. And it's I just keep it simple. Right. And you mentioned that your uncle kind of introduced you to your love of flying as well as your love of real estate. It sounds like that's a very influential person in your life. Can you tell me about your relationship with that person and how real estate sort of entered into into the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. So when I was, I was about 10 years old, my parents split. Uh, I moved from Southern California to Scottsdale and my uncle, he was actually a builder in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, when I was a young man, he brought me on the job sites because for, for, for me, I was just trying to, okay, what, what's next. Right. So I wanted a car. Um, and so he started teaching me about real estate. He was a builder. Uh, he always wanted to be a commercial airline pilot, but one day he took off, he was flying and uh, he actually scared himself because he couldn't find the airport. And so he literally gave up on his dream of becoming a commercial airline pilot. And so when I was 17 years old, I didn't have any money and we were flying and I asked him, I said, Hey, look, you know, can I get actually get paid to, to do this? And he said, yeah. And so, you know, really that when that that's when aviation was introduced into my life from a young man. And I really just, you know, just started grinding. I started flying every single day. I put the real estate on hold, but I always knew that I wanted to come back to it. So that's really how it was introduced to me. Uh, from a young age, and you know, I just I, I had to wait because I didn't have any money. So that's awesome. So that's how you ended up in in aviation. But what was life like in the early days of your career in aviation or in the real estate? Uh, in aviation. So I mean, look, in aviation, when you first get started out, it's it's you're traveling a lot. You're not making a lot of money. My first year as a commercial airline pilot, I think I made forty eight thousand dollars a year because they had to put so much time and energy and effort into training me. And so I went and got a loan, student loan for 140 grand. My first year, I made 48 grand. I was a first officer on a $40 million jet. And I was traveling all over the US, Canada, and Mexico. And um, as I built seniority, life started to become better for me. And I started getting more days off. And so you fast track that to 25 years old. This is actually where 2008, 2009, 2010 happened. And um, it was really great timing for me because I started making money in the airline. Uh, there was great deals in real estate in Arizona. And so that's actually when I bought my first, uh, uh, what I call a crash pad, which is really cool because in aviation, it's kind of like uh, the, the house hacking. But in, in, in aviation, we call it a, a crash pad where you rent your rooms out to these other pilots. And so I bought my first home and um, I was able to rent out three of the rooms, collect net profit of 400 bucks, and so, and so that was, that was really my start in real estate. It was a single family home in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And I was making 400 bucks. I was living in the uh, master bedroom. And that's when I realized I needed to do something bigger. So why didn't you scale and just buy a whole bunch of properties and make them all crash pads? Because it's management intensive. The, the reason I didn't do that is because you had to manage it. Like I literally, I went home one night and uh, you know, you, it's, it's a common area. You share everything. And I didn't want to, uh, you know, I could have scaled it with many homes and it would have been a great business, 
but it's really management intensive. There's a lot of people coming in and out of the, uh, the homes and, um, it, it's just really, really heavy on the time. What I, what I started looking at is, okay, how do I buy these apartments? So my next deal was a fourplex because I didn't want to live with the renters. I didn't want to live with the people. And, and, and so that's, that's where my breakthrough happened where I was like, okay, I could do these single family, but how do I, how do I scale? So how did you have the vision or the foresight to even save and invest in your first property? Do you remember how much you had saved up to even get into this crash pad house hacking situation? Yeah. So uh, I bought that as my primary. So I needed like three and a half percent down. I think I put down like 10 grand. Um, I'm very frugal when it comes to money. And so even when I was making 50, 60, 70 grand, I was able to save, you know, 10 grand a year. What had happened was on my next deal, I saved up 25 grand because I actually had a, a, a car that I had bought and flipped in order to get the 25 grand to put down on the fourplex. And so I've just, I've always been creative. I've always, I've always saved my money to invest it, but I just, I just knew that, um, I had to keep buying deals because I wanted the cash flow. I want I wanted to buy a deal and, and and actually make some passive income. Yeah, I always thought, you know, commercial airline pilots were, you know, the pretty high salaried starting right at the top, but it sounds like no matter what, you you sort of have this base salary and incrementally over the years just like any job, it kind of grows. Is there like a a side to that where it is super juicy, a really lucrative salary that you were sort of looking forward to and that was kind of what was going to fuel your real estate in the future? Or did you not really have aspirations to go all in on, in the real estate space early on? Early on, I literally thought that I'd buy a single family home and buy another one and buy another one and then you know have some multifamily. Uh, I didn't really think of it as like I'd be um, a huge multifamily apartment owner or operator. I just, you know, I didn't have the, I didn't have the, the belief. I didn't have the vision at that point in time. And I, I think like any of us, we just, you know, we want to start off with our first deal. And we want to kind of get our feet wet. Like I literally, when I bought my first deal, I didn't even know what they were talking about when they asked me, hey, you know, you want to buy down a point? You want conventional? Do you want FHA? I, I had no idea what any of that meant because I was never taught that in school. So, you know, for me, it was like, okay, once I found out I could do the first deal, it excited me because I was making 400 bucks. My second deal, I was making $600, but it was a fourplex. And I actually bought that. It was a, a foreclosure and I redid everything. And, and the biggest mistake that I did was I, I thought I had to do it myself. So I had no, I, I had no idea I'd end up with 21 units at the age of 30. I just knew that once I bought my first deal and I said, if you could do one, you could do two. If you could do two, I could do four. If I could do five, I could do 10. And so I literally just started reading a bunch of books. I mean, I, I really like to just figure things out. I'm very curious. And so once, once, once I had my first deal, I was like, okay, what's next? That's pretty cool. Yeah. So 21 by the age of 30 is re really quite the accomplishment. You said you wanted to get into this and you're like, I'm just going to buy a single family house, single family house, single family house. You know, a lot of people have different reasons for getting into real estate, but what was yours? Did you have a why or a motivation that, because like, it's very, like, I would say, I don't want to say rare, but it's not like a lot of people go into real estate like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy one and one on. Like, usually there's some kind of turning point or some kind of fuel that's like firing them up. What was that reason for you? So when I would go to work at the airline, I, what, I, what I started to realize is that when I was having these conversations about real estate uh, with my family and with coworkers, a lot of them were saying, oh, you know, you know, be careful. Um, you know, real estate's risky. And my turning point for me was, you know, I was going to work every single day and I was trading my time for money. And at the time I was getting paid a hundred bucks or 120 per hour. And I was like, how long can I do this for? Like, like, like how long can I travel uh, for the airlines? And so I really had that turning point because I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, like how long are you going to trade your time for money? And, and that was awakening for me. And that's really what got me on that path to real estate is like, okay, if I can make money here, put it to work in real estate and then get the cash flow to pay off my student loans. I mean, you guys have to realize I was in debt 140 grand. I was in debt 140 grand and people are like, pay it off as soon as you can, pay it off as soon as you can. And so what I did is I bought a fourplex 
with the 25 grand and the extra, the extra cash flow that I was getting from the fourplex, I would just pay down an extra $400 on my student loans every month. And with, but literally by the age of 30 years old, I had $140,000 paid off. I still had the principal, Rob and Dave, like I still had the principal working for me and my student loans were paid off. So, so for, for me, it was really just that shift at like 24 and 25. Cause although my uncle was very helpful in my early age, he didn't understand cash flow. He didn't understand having the assets because remember, he was a builder. He would build to sell for a profit. When I started getting my head right and my mental right, I was like, man, I want to, I want to, I want to buy it. I want to hold it. I want to cash flow it. And I want to get the benefits that real estate actually provides. Do you remember the, just out of curiosity, because, um, you know, student loan payments, they aren't very friendly. Uh, what was the student loan payment like on $140,000? It was like 600 bucks for 30 years. What? That's nothing. But 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 I mean it was it was it was back in, you know, 2002 where interest rates were lower and and you know you paid 600 or 700 bucks per month in over 30 years that's a long time, right? It's over 30 years. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot more sense cuz I was paying like 1000 bucks, but it was amortized over 10 or yeah, 10 years or something like that. Okay, so 600 bucks, I mean, not super bad, but obviously like if you could replace that with income, that was sort of like the goal. You're like, let's chop that out. And then let's start figuring out how to use real estate to sort of fuel the, the overall wealth of your life, right? Well, yeah. And everybody was telling me, like, I had 25 grand. They're like, no, you should pay off your student loan. And I was like, no, no, hang on, hang on. Let me go buy a four unit. The rents were like 500 bucks. So I was literally collecting two grand from four units. The mortgage and everything was like $1,200. And, you know, after expenses and everything, I had like 600 bucks. So I would literally take the 600 bucks, double it, and I would just start chipping it down. So that way, when the student loan was paid off, I still had this four unit or I still had that principal uh, working for me. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's cool. So was there any benefit to being a pilot and getting into the real estate world and as a pilot, just flying around into new markets, discovering markets? Yeah. Like certainly you must have been more privy to markets than the typical investor that never actually may get to visit a market before they invest there. It was a huge advantage because I was based. So, so I was based at Chicago Air, LaGuardia, DC. My last base was actually Denver. And so I was able to go and see these cities and I was always shopping real estate on my overnights. And then also I was getting like 13, 14, 15 days off because typically in the aviation space, you get four days on, four days off, four days on, four days off. And so it actually gave me time when I got back home to Scottsdale, I can go and look at real estate. When I bought my first deal, I'd have four or five days to actually renovate the units. And so for sure, like I always think the biggest mistake for people is when they're so like when you grow up somewhere, you have to go and see other cities. You have to go and see other spots because you see the growth, you see the trends, you see different things that maybe you're not seeing in your city. You see the path of progress. So I've always been a student and, and I've always loved real estate. So I used to take advantage of like, okay, the airline's paying for my hotel. The airline's paying for me to overnight. The airline's paying me to eat. So when I was done doing all my job and all my duties, I would go and shop and drive blocks and in, in shop real estate all over the US. That's cool. So I, the thing that, that is always going to be like, I th- I'd, love, I'd love your insight on how you can do this because you're probably going to be uh, a big help to a lot of the audience today, uh, which is a lot of people get really nervous about investing long distance. And they're like, man, you know what happens if I get called in the middle of the night and this and that? You were on an airplane. And uh, it's not like you can just take a phone call on an airplane. Uh, because they make you put it in airplane mode, but mostly because you don't have reception, right? So uh, if you if you don't have reception and you can't physically answer a phone call, how can you even run a real estate business that way? Well, it's difficult. Um, you know, and, and honestly, when I bought my fourplex, I was managing it myself. Um, I'd have my girlfriend help me. Like when we're all getting started out, you literally have to get creative. So my girlfriend would help me like if I was traveling. Um, but typically, you know, if they left a voicemail, I'd get back with them within four or five. My typical flights were between, you know, call it two and four hours. Um, so that wasn't a huge issue. But yeah, no, it's 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 a big deal. Like when you buy deals in other cities and states, you want to make sure you have boots on the ground because you have to have somebody who's managing it very close. 
And that's actually one of my biggest fears. Like that's why I started, when I started investing in real estate, I started investing in my backyard because I was actually terrified. I was so scared to go to uh, um, uh, San Antonio in Austin because Texas was a really big market back in 2012, 2013. There was a lot of that growth between Austin and San Antonio, but I was always so terrified because um, I didn't have any boots on the ground. I didn't know any management companies. I didn't know anybody who, who, who managed real estate. And the smaller the deal is, the harder it is to find a management company to actually manage it. Were you pretty good at that point? You know, you said that you're, you're working with your girlfriend and she's picking up the slack for you a little bit. Were you pretty good at sort of turning off the real estate button while you were flying? Or did it take a while for you to sort? Because like for me, when I go into the movie theaters, that this is my big, my big thing. When I go into a movie theater, I'm like, I'm not going to get to enjoy this movie because I'm definitely going to get a text message or a phone call right. in the middle of this movie. And of course, it always does happen. Was that ever? Did that ever happen? Did you ever go through that when you were up in the air? Or were you able to shut that off pretty easily? Uh, you can't shut it off. It's it's. I, I'm the same as you. Like I'm always looking at my phone. Um, it's just, it's just always like, I was actually, I, I used to not go on vacations because I was like, well, what if the toilet gets backed up? What if they call me? Like, what if they do this? Like, what if I'm international and they can't get a hold of me? Like I was, I was the, I was the typical scared young investor in real estate and I wanted to do it and manage it all myself. So we haven't covered who you actually started working for as a pilot yet. How did you go from commercial, uh, to, to private, uh, as a pilot? So this is a crazy story. I actually was... Um, when I had 21 units, I was 30 years old and I said, okay, what's next? And I, I, I knew that I always, by this time, I knew that I wanted to, to own and operate and control multifamily units. I just didn't have anybody where I was from that was doing like what Grant was doing. So at 30 years old, I said, what's next? And uh, on YouTube and actually Bigger Pockets, I found Grant Cardone. And on Bigger Pockets podcast, this is crazy. He's like, look, I've got like 3000 units. I'm looking to grow. I'm looking to scale. If there's anybody out there who's listening, who wants to come and join my team, call me. And I picked up the phone and I called him and I literally didn't even get an interview with Grant. I got an interview with his team and they're like, well, we don't really have a job in the real estate yet. Uh, cause they knew I was a pilot. They're like, we don't even have an airplane yet. It's coming in two weeks, but we got a sales job, like a sales role job. And I said, perfect. I'll take it. And so literally two weeks later, uh, I packed all my stuff in, in Scottsdale in Arizona and I moved out to Miami and I started working for Grant Cardone. And I just, I just, I knew like, like the way he was talking about real estate, when I heard him on bigger pockets, when I heard him on YouTube, like I just knew that he wanted to grow and scale his portfolio. And I was like, man, instead of me doing this by myself, how cool would that be to do it with somebody who has already has like a huge head start from where I was? And so that's what I did. Yeah, that's crazy. So how long ago was that? That was nine years ago. Okay. So he was this Grant Cardone. Was he established at this point? I mean, because now obviously he's got a huge name, huge platform, huge portfolio. What did it look like back then? Was he super established? Because it seems like you just took a giant risk, you know, to go work for him. What did you see in, in kind of where he was at that moment? Yeah. So I, I saw the opportunity in the real estate market, but I saw Grant was, was, was very passionate and he he understood real estate. He had about 3000 units at the time. So we kind of operated kind of like a single family uh like a family office. Uh so you know he he would buy the deal, invest it in himself like he he so he would buy a deal, he would take his money, he would invest the money and he would hold it for long term. We didn't have like the Cardone capital and the crowdfunding and you know the 12,000 units. We 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 had none of that. It was literally like Grant Cardone was a a, a business and a consultant. And he had real estate on the side, and that's it. Man, that's nuts. Okay, and then you didn't even. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say, did you become a private pilot for him, or did you join his sales team? So I joined a sales team, and then two weeks later, he. It, it, so two weeks later, he bought a Gulfstream G two hundred, and and Elena. I met Elena day one. I was like, look, I love flying airplanes. I got ten. I, I had almost ten thousand hours at that time. Like I was literally flying every single day, building up my time. And so I had almost 10,000 hours. I said, I love flying. I love real estate. And I love helping people. And she's like, does Grant know this? I says, no. Uh, and she's like, well, we're buying an airplane. And so Grant was hire, like looking to hire these other pilots. And he called me in his office one day and he's like, look, if I hire you to be my pilot, will you also work with me and my companies and in my businesses on the downtime? And I said, where do I sign? And so I literally signed a three-year contract with Grant to be his pilot, but then also work with him 
in whatever business, whether it's the sales, whether it's the real estate, whatever it was, I just knew that he was the right guy. Cool. Wow. What what a crazy story, man. I don't think... Uh, well, first of all, I think the craziest thing is that you were like, yeah, he said to call him. So I picked up the phone and I called him. I feel like different time. Rob, I was terrified. Like I was on the line because it's, it's, it's Grant Cardone, right? I was like, you know, when you call anybody, like, like if I was calling... If I wanted to go work for David and I'm 30 years old, it's like, man, David's this and you're this, like, like you're like, you don't know what you're calling, right? So I, I was calling Grant's office and I was like, I want to come work for Grant. And it was a little bit nerve wracking because I was taking a huge risk because I was giving up my career. I was giving up the airlines. I was giving up the 401ks. I was giving up the 18 days off. Like I had built an awesome career for myself, but I just knew there was something bigger. I want to ask you when you made the call, because here's why I'm asking if I'm being transparent. This gets spoken about a lot. We just spoke with Tarek El Musa today, and he's like, you got to try. You got to reach out. And so this gets spoken about often from influencers. And what that translates into is me getting 40 DMs a day from 23-year-old guys that are like, I'll do this. I'll run your social media. I'll build a course for you. I'll automate something and make money off of you. And meanwhile, this kid has 300 followers, and he's telling me he's going to grow my brand. And it's like exhausting having people reach out and say, I want to work from you. And you're like, what can you do? And they're like, yeah, I don't know. Just tell me what you want me to do. And we get in this stalemate, right? So I'm sure if you spoke to Grant, you came in with a plan, you proposed something and you thought about it. Can you share with our audience the effort you put in before you made the call so we don't give the impression simply making the call leads to life-changing things and you end up on the Bigger Pockets podcast and you have this huge story? Well, look, I I, I think that I started building my resume and I started building my skill set. Cause to your point, you know, you, you have to have a skill set that adds massive value to the team. Otherwise, you just don't add massive value. Like if I call up Grant and said, Hey, I want to run your social media, I want to do this, like, like I don't have any experience doing it. What I did is I said, Hey, look, I, I wanted to be super easy, by the way. But I said, look, I, I, I've got a career in aviation. Like if you're gonna buy an airplane, I will run the entire flight department for you and I'll do it for I'll do it for free. Like people don't the one thing that people don't realize, like I would have done this for free because when you get really close to somebody like Grant, like David, like Rob, like me now, uh, there's it's it's so valuable because you just learn a whole new skill set. And so my pitch was three things. Um, I know how to fly airplanes. And Grant actually kind of made a crack at me one day. He's like, do you really know how to fly? I'm like, look, in four weeks, I can get type rate on your airplane and I'll be the lead captain and I will be there every single day. I haven't called in sick in 10 years at my current airline. And I also have 21 units in real estate that I know they're kind of junk, but I want to grow and scale, but give me the shot at the flying first, and then I'll work into the the real estate piece. And so really, I think that that was the big value add piece because number one, I was willing to come and make phone calls. I was terrible at it, by the way. I was like, I was making sales calls, but I was willing to do it. And that showed Grant really like, I'm willing to do any, like, honestly, guys, I'll sweep the floors. Uh, I'll make the phone calls. I could be at the top. I could be at the middle. I could be at the bottom. I'm willing to do what other people are not willing to do. And he saw that from day one. And also it helped that I met Elena on like day two. And she, cause, cause Elena has been a huge part of my success. Meaning that, you know, when I got in here, she's like, Hey, Ryan likes real estate. Hey, Ryan can fly airplanes. Hey, Ryan like this. Like, cause that, that's really what led into me transitioning from being the pilot into real estate few things that we should highlight from that. One, you didn't come with vagueness or ambiguity. You said, I can help you in this way. And here is why you can trust me. When we get someone that reaches out and they're like, just tell me something that doesn't work. You showed clear value Two, you said, I'll do it for free. Oftentimes when people reach out, they're hoping that they get paid in some way or it's some kind of a partnership and you don't know who they are. So you're not comfortable with that. So you took the smart road and said, let me just build trust with the person. I'll work for three for free. And three, you offered to work in a capacity where you said making phone calls in a system he already had established. Grant did not have to take you and say, follow me around, kid, and I'll teach you the ropes on the first day. He could plug you into a team he already had, and they could evaluate your character, your skills. They could see what you were good at. That would be the equivalent of someone saying, hey, David, I want to come be a real estate agent on your team. I could say yes to that because I could stick them with another agent, and they could tell me how they're doing versus I have to be the way to evaluate, which means I'm probably going to say no until I know the person better. So that right there is incredibly valuable. That's great. I think you you, you nailed down like his like pain point, right? And you're like, a pain point is if you're buying a, a plane, someone's got to fly the plane, right? Like a thousand percent of the time when I 
work with someone from like that reaches out, it's because they've heard me say something on the podcast. They've heard me say something on my YouTube channel, on Instagram. That's like, oh, I'm really struggling with this. Like, I cannot figure this thing out. Or does anyone have a recommendation? When someone's like, oh, hey, I've got the solution to that very specific problem you have. Boom. Like door open immediately, right? Uh, it's a hundred percent what you said, David. I think you you framed that up pretty correctly. Find the value, solve the pain. Yeah, and Rob, I didn't negotiate too. Like when he said, "Here's the deal," I just said, "Hey, where do you want to sign?" He's like, "I want to do a three year deal with you." I was like, "I'll do a 10. because I just knew. Like I like I just I, I hope that if if people could take one thing away, if you can get around the movers and shakers, if you can get around the people who are actually doing deals. That's my advice to all the young guys out there. It's like when I'm to my 21 year old self, if you could add value to a team, if you can get around a team who's already doing what you want, that is the fast track. Yeah. It's just take note there. It's not about reaching out to someone with a terrible pitch or saying, I just want to work with you. You have to be clear about what you're looking for if you want to get a clear response back from the person, but it can work out really well when they do it the way that we're describing here. Now, we understand there was a pivotal moment when you went from flying high to being grounded. Can you share what happened in Alabama? Yeah, so as I was early, you know, Elena was a huge part of my career in in, in, in bringing me into what I call the circle. Um, I literally, in Christmas, uh, it was eight years ago, we landed the airplane in Fairhope, Alabama, which is a super cool runway. It's like really, really small. We landed the G200 there. It's kind of a private airstrip. Uh, and I went to the hotel. And this is over Christmas. And Elena calls me. She's like, hey, look, you know, you guys are a crew. Because the one thing about Grant and Elena is that they actually, the people who work with them and work for them, they, they're, they're really like an extended family. And so, you know, she's like, hey, do you want to come over for, you know, Christmas dinner? It's at her parents' house. And I'm like, I looked at the other pilot and Rob and David, I you not he said uh i'm like hey they just invited us to come over for dinner and the other pilot's like no nah, i'll pass you know i'm gonna go down the street and you know eat at this pub or whatever and i'm like really like like you don't want to go and have dinner with the, the the boss and so i went over to the house and i noticed when i got there grant was a little bit aggravated and i started asking him questions like well what's going on and he's like well i have a property that's 10 minutes north of here and when I went there, the pool was dirty, the blinds were down, it was closed, there was nobody there. And he's like, I pulled up a report and I had 40 units. I have 40 units that are not leased. And I was like, wow. I was like, that is like, I'm like, that's, that's, that's BS, number one. But I was like, two, how can I help you? And he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, how do I help you? Like, like, uh, what uh, I want to lease those units. And he's like, you would do that? And I was like, yeah, I was like, heck yeah, tell me more about it. And so he started going on and telling me about the property and everything else. And I looked at him, I said, well, what if I parked the airplane in Miami when we landed uh, in three days and I came back up here and I rented those 40 units for you, would that be of service? Would that help you? And he's like, wow, he's like, you would do that. And I said, absolutely, I'm gonna get a plane ticket right now and I'm gonna come up here. And I have, guys, you gotta keep in mind, like I've never ran a 344 unit complex before. I have 21 units. And uh, I took a huge risk and I was like, you know what? I'm willing to do it because I knew I could lease. I knew I could call. I knew, I knew like if I just got in this building, I can lease 40 units in 40 days. So I told him, I'll lease 40 units in 40 days. Will you give me a shot? And he's like, come up here. Let's do it. And so that, yes, yeah, so that, that's the transition. That, that, that was my transition where Grant actually gave me a shot working in the, in, in the real estate. And I was up there the, the next week. Okay. So a couple of things. You, you've kind of mentioned you were working with Elena was pivotal in this uh, kind of relationship with you and Grant. Who is that for reference? So Elena Cardone is Grant's wife. Got it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And so you're flying for them. You're, uh, I guess you're doing phone sales a little bit at the beginning of it. And then he's like, I, I, I got to lease all these units. And you're like, I'm going to do it. He's like, wow, you would do this for me? You're like, great. And you go and you do it. How did you actually lease 40 units in, in how long? So, so the, the, the task and the goal was 40 units in 40 days over, over, over New Year's and over Christmas holiday. Okay. All right. So how the heck did you do that? So here's the, here's the cool thing. So I went up there the next week and he's like, look, I want you to get an air mattress <laughs> and I want you to live on site. The high life right there. Yeah, yeah. And I want, and I want you to stay in a one bedroom apartment. And I'm like, okay, I was just willing to do whatever it took. And so I flew up there, got an air mattress, got a one bedroom put the air mattress up. And I was literally like the first day that I walked into the uh, leasing office, I realized really quick that there was nobody leasing. There was no leadership. The manager was posting on Facebook. There was like three likes. I'm like, well, clearly that's not a lead gen. 
And so I called Grant. I said, what would Grant do? And he says, this is what I would do, Ryan. He's like, I'd go back in the last 90 days, pull out the list and print it off of all the people who came in and didn't rent. And I'm like, perfect, done. He's like, I'd call them, I'd paint a picture and I'd get them back in there and I'd lease them a unit. And I, he's like, I'd just start with that. And so without doing anything else, I pulled the list. I started calling people, cold calling them, right? Hey, you know, you came to this apartment complex, you know, 30 days ago, 45 days ago. Uh, have you found a place yet? Nope, I haven't. Perfect. I found the perfect unit for you. Uh, we actually have a discount. We have a special right now. Uh, come back in tomorrow. I've already picked out your unit. And so I started getting all these people coming in. I literally started getting all these people coming in. I said, what else would you do, Grant? He's like, well, I'd go put your phone number on the front side of the building. On the, on the street, I'd go and put your cell number. I'm like, perfect, I'll go get a sign made. And so I went and got a sign made, got some new balloons, got new flowers, started cold calling people like on the 90-day list. And I started going knocking on doors of all the businesses in the five-mile radius. And uh, within 15 days, I had 15 leases, each lease every single day. And by the 15th day, he called me back. He says, Ryan, get your ass back here. You are now part of the real estate team. <laughs> Man, dude, rock and roll. I, I honestly am really impressed because I feel like I would be already pessimistic about that advice of like, call everyone who has come in in the last 45 days and see if they are interested. Because I would have assumed everyone found a place. Right. And that wasn't the case. <laughs> That's what we call follow up. As a side note, that is the number one biggest area where people need improvement in almost every business. I call it lead bleed in the real estate books I wrote, the top producer series. So much of the time it's lead bleeds what's hurting you. You write an offer on a house, they say no, you forget to go back and check a couple of weeks later. You just assume someone else bought it. The thing's still sitting there, the sellers are singing a different tune right? Maybe someone else tried to put it in escrow and they accepted and then it fell out of escrow and they're heartbroken. And if you show up at that exact time, they'll take an offer for 75 grand less, but you're looking for the next deal that you can just write the offer on and try to get what we frequently give advice. You got to write a lot of offers, but we never remind people go back and write offers on houses that you were already rejected for. It's that same principle. And yeah, he's smart. He knows that. That's crazy. That's good. So you're all right. So you, you get the 15 done 15 days. What about the other uh, 25 units? Was Grant no longer worried about that because you sort of figured out those systems for the rest of the team or, or what? Yeah. So what happened was I identified who the real leadership was coming from in the uh, community, which was the assistant manager. And so what, what happened was uh, we promoted the assistant to the management role. And then also on the maintenance standpoint, because that's also a big thing in multifamily and apartments, right? Is you have to turn the units and make them ready because everybody, when you show an apartment, just like when you show a house, David, you know this better than anybody, you want to show the end result. You want to show the finished product. So I think, you know, 20 days, I was there for about 20, 15 to 20 days. And that was plenty of time to identify who the players were, give them uh, enough momentum and energy. Because look, when, when a guy like, myself or you or David go into somewhere like this, that's great energy. And you could really start building that momentum. So we got that place leased. It was like 95% within 30 days. And then the, the proper team members were in there. So now I could start going and focusing on, because at the time I think you had 3000 units to 300. So you had about 10 deals. I was able to go and start working on other deals because that's really where I started cutting my teeth in this business is I, I, I wanted to make sure that Grant's portfolio was running 10 X. And so he started putting me on all these other deals saying, hey, you get in touch with this management company. You get in touch with this property manager. You go and just make sure that you're going through all these deals. And so, um, yeah, I leased 15 units. I came back here. There was uh, a team of two. It was called Grant Cardone and Ryan Seckel. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what we built off of. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, what you just showed is not not only were you willing to you know roll up your sleeves, get get your uh, your hands dirty, but you actually succeeded. Uh, that's the thing is anyone might be willing to go out there and try it, but you actually did it. Were you already a natural leader? Was this something that you were good at? Are you particularly a charismatic salesperson, or was it sort of like a fake it till you make it type of thing? I, I think I've always had the ability to learn. Um, I think, you know, back what David asked me earlier is, you know, how, how did the, the leadership and the pilot skills transfer into what you're doing now? You know, I, I was a captain for nine years of a 70 passenger jet, $40 million airplane. Uh, leadership is highly trained in the airlines. And I think that, you know, from, from a piloting standpoint is I'm very systematic. I am very logical and I just, I, I, I'm a people person. Uh, I think people are the most important part of the business. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's this and it's this and this. It's the people. 
If a deal is doing bad, it's the people. If a deal is doing good, it's the people. Because you could have a great deal and crappy people, the deal is not going to do great. You could have a okay deal and have great people, the deal is actually going to do really well. So I, I think I think that the people are super important, and I think that you know for me I've had a lot of great mentors where I'm just willing to do stuff that people aren't, and, and I also had a great mentor, Grant. You know, Grant Grant had the ability to, like I was calling him every day. This is what built my relationship with Grant is I was calling him. What would you do? What would you do? What would you do? And and also to one of the David's points too, like Grant was not in the mood. Like Grant's not going to teach me anything. Grant's going to put me in the positions to learn. Like that's what people are making the mistakes. Like they're calling people saying that's and just adjusting the expectations on that. Ryan Grant can't teach you anything. Even if he could, it'd be like drinking from a fire hose. You don't have the capacity to sponge up what Grant would be able to teach you. It's I, I give you an analogy. Like when you're learning from a black belt and you're first learning the martial art, they probably don't remember what you need to learn because they were five years old when they learned that. It it doesn't make sense. They were not a grown person trying to understand these concepts. They were a kid whose brain soaked it up quickly, right? But we all think, I want to be trained by the best person ever. That's not the right coach for you. You want a person a step, maybe two steps ahead. Grant has an ecosystem that he can put you in with people that are somewhat vetted, that have a standard that he upholds that have a system that he had a hand in creating that puts you in a position to succeed, right? So that black belt built a school. He picked out instructors. Those people can teach you the martial art you're trying to learn so much better. I love you're saying that because there's this idea where our ego says, I want to learn from Grant Cardone. I want the best. And now you're useless to him because you can't keep up with the level of stuff he does. However, if you get plugged into his world, you learn something there. You prove yourself valuable. You become one of those captains at some point that he's put in place, you're training the new people. Now, as you gain the experience of living there, you do get to a level that you can start to rub elbows with Grant and what he needs is helpful. Would you like to add anything into just that story of how you're kind of, you climb the ranks? Well, uh, just, just to hit on that point too, like, like Grant was never the type where he was like, sit down and let me teach you, you know, how to do a deal or how to do multifamily. I'll just add this, you know, when I, when I got heavy in the properties, I, I, I got on these calls and I was learning from all the property managers and the regional managers and, and, and the, the really, really smart people in the real estate. When it comes to lending, Grant put me uh, around a bunch of bankers and a bunch of brokers. And so I had to learn the lingo. So so everything, David, that you were mentioning, like like in real estate, there's different buckets, right? You, you got to find a deal and you have to get with the brokers who are selling the deals. Grant put me into the wolf. To, to the cage and I learned the lingo and I learned the relationships because, because you're so right. Like you can't build these relationships by yourself. You have to get around people who already have the relationships. And then you actually, by association, you become very powerful because you now have the relationships because you get spooled up quicker. Same thing with debt, same thing with uh, property management companies, same thing with all of the stuff in real estate. So I just think that, you know, for me, I understood that I wasn't going to go back to Grant and say, Hey, Grant, what can you teach me? I would always go back to Grant David and say, what's next? What do you want me to help you? Can I take off your plate? What's next? And he loved that. You know, I'm always a guy who likes and wants more responsibility. I just kept going back because my bandwidth is there. Like I have bandwidth, right? Like I'm like, we're at 12,000 units. We have office, we have multifamily. I'm like, what's next? I think a lot of us get bogged down and like, oh, well, this is a problem, but this is a problem. Leaders have solutions. Leaders, non-leaders have problems. And for me, I always wanted to come back to Grant with a solution. 